Hello viewers, welcome to my channel. Today I am going to discuss stanza wise summary of the poem Ode to the West Wind with explanation. So let's start. But before that, share the channel and must provide your feedback in the comment section and don't forget to subscribe it. Uh, so this is our topic Ode to the West Wind. It's summary and stanza wise annotation. Let's start. At first, about the poet. Parsibi Shelley, lifespan 1792 to 1822, one of the prominent revolutionary romantic poets, was an uncompromising idealist. He remained a radical throughout his life. We all know that Shelley is mainly famous for being a revolutionary poet. In 1811, Shelley published a pamphlet called The Necessity of Atheism which resulted in his expulsion from Oxford. In the same year, he eloped with Harriet and married her. Within two years, he ran away to Switzerland with Mary, the daughter of famous William Godwin, a social and political reformer. This Godwin is famous mainly for his work and inquiry concerning political justice. Okay. The recognition of Shelley's achievements in poetry grew steadily following his death. That is, Shelley became famous only after his death. Next, on 8 July 1822, less than at the age of 30, Shelley died by drowning in a sudden storm on the Gulf of La Spezia while returning from Leon in a small boat. Some believe his death was not accidental that Shelley was depressed and wanted to die. Several days after Shelley's body was washed ashore and was cremated on the beach by his friends Byron, Hunt and Trelawney. In Shelley's pocket was a small book of Keats's poetry. Next about his work. The main features of Shelley's works are lyrical power, first one, then revolutionary idealism, then prophetic note, then myth-making quality, sensuousness, melody and music. These are the features to be found in his poetry. Next, besides a powerful essay, defense of poetry, so this is the essay Shelley wrote. Shelley's best lyrics are the cloud to a skylark, lament to night or to the west wind, etc. His longer poems include number one, Queen Mab, published in 1813, then Alastor, published in 1816, then The Revolt of Islam, published in 1818, then Prometheus Unbound, the famous lyrical drama, published in 1820, next Hellas, published in 1821, and then Adonis, published in 1820. One. Next, about the poem. What to the West Wind written in 1819. So, the poem was written in 1819. Near Florence was originally published in 1820 by Charles in London as part of the collection Prometheus Unbound. So, What to the West Wind was published along with Prometheus Unbound in 1820. Next, the poem begins with three sections describing the wind's effects upon earth in the first stanza, then air and then ocean. In the last two sections, the poet speaks directly to the wind asking for its power to lift him up and make him its companion in his wanderings. The poem ends with an optimistic note, mind it, note of optimism, which is that if winter days are here, then spring is not very far. That is ray of hope or optimism. Next, the poem can be divided in two parts. The first three cantos are about the qualities of the wind or west wind and each ends with the invocation over oh, here. The last two cantos give a relation between the wind and the speaker. Next. The poem is an address to the west wind of England during autumn. So, Shelley addresses the west wind of autumn, not the wind of any other season. 
Next, during autumn season, the west wind becomes violent and fierce. The west wind is the symbol of indomitable power and strength. Shelley wishes to attain this power in order to drive away what is old in the society and give birth to a new millennium where liberty, equality and fraternity can bloom. Next, the poem consists of five sections or cantos or stanzas written in Tarjarima. You know what is Tarjarima? It is also called chain rhyme. Tarjarima is a verse form consisting of a sequence of interlinked tarsets. The sequence closes with one line or in a few cases two lines. It was invented by Dante for his divine comedy. Each section consists of four tarsets rhyming ABA, then BCB, then CDC, then DED and rhyming a couplet EE. So that's total 13 lines. Hence what do we find is that each stanza or canto of the poem consists of 14 lines. Clear? Next. This ode is written in iambic pentameter. So this was about the poem. Now stanza wise summary, first stanza. We know in the first stanza Shelley describes the activities of the west wind on earth or land and here the west wind plays dual roles that is as a destroyer and side by side preserver. Shelley addresses the west wind and personifies it. So we find personification as a living spirit of timeless energy. It is the life of autumn. Why life of autumn? Because autumn is also personified. This wind like an enchanter or magician. So the west wind is compared to an enchanter. Drives away the leaves of different decaying colors. Why decaying? Because we find that the colors are black, hectic, red, yellow, etc. So these are decaying colors. These leaves seem to be the victims of an epidemic disease or deadly disease. Next, it also drives the seeds underground where they lie through autumn and winter with the advent of spring. These seeds sprout out and plains and hills are filled with living color and fragrance. So in the first stanza, we find that west wind destroys what is old rooting and rooting and at the same time it drives the seeds underground so that they may germinate with the advent of spring. Now annotation stanza 1 get the text with you. Line number 1 O wild west wind address why address you know this is an ode. So the first and foremost characteristic of an ode is address impassioned address passionate address so apostrophe and again alliteration why alliteration look at this www are repeated because alliteration in an alliteration the same word letter or syllable is repeated at the beginning of successive or nearly successive word and here we find the repetition of w so it's an alliteration next in the same line breath of autumn's being autumn is personified okay next unseen presence paradoxical statement the wind is felt but not seen we can't see the wind but we can feel the presence of the wind that's why unseen presence next line number two to three the leaves like ghosts here we find another comparison it's simile. Why simile? Because you know that in a simile, an explicit comparison is made between two different or unallied objects. And here the two different things are lips and ghosts. And the comparison is made explicit by the word like. So it's simile. Clear? Next. Line 3. From an enchanter fleeing metaphor. Because the west wind is compared to an enchanter. Next, line 5, pestilence strike and multitudes, metaphor. Why metaphor? Because the leaves of various decaying colors are compared to that of multitudes or group of people having deadly disease. Next, 
line 8 is like a corpse the seeds are compared to corpse or dead body so like comparison simile next line number 9 as your sister actually this is the spring wind and the spring wind is also called jepha personification why personification because the spring wind is considered as sister female personify okay next line number 11 driving sweet birds like sweet birds like it's a simile why simile because like a shepherd jeffer or the gentle spring wind nourishes the birds to bloom that means it means that the gentle spring wind helps the birds to bloom or nourishes the birds that's why simile next line 14 destroyer and preserver the keynote of the stanza west wind plays dual roles okay images of death and rebirth death means because destruction is necessary for regeneration it is shelley's own prophetic vision because shelley also wants to destroy the old established custom and creed in order to have a new regenerated world next stanza 2 summary the west wind creates storms and scatters loose clouds over the horizon up to the zenith of the sky here we find the activity of the west wind on the sky okay and here west wind creates a storm or commotion next these clouds are messengers of rain and lightning because these clouds indicate the advent of rain and lightning these clouds resemble the disabled hair of fierce maynard the clouds covering the whole sky resemble the disabled hair of fierce maynard maynard you know female worship of bacchus next the sound of the wind seemed to be the dirge or funeral song of the dying year year is also personified dying year and when the west wind blows a loud sound produces and this sound is considered to be the dance or funeral song of the dying year why dying because the year is not dead but it's going to die next the sky dense with clouds look like a dome of a buried year the sky covered with clouds seems to be a dome of the buried year these very clouds will bring thunder, lightning, and hail. Next, annotation of second stanza. Line number two, loose clouds like arts. It's simile. Why simile? Because in the line, we find loose clouds like arts decaying leaves. So, clouds are compared to leaves. And the comparison is explicit by the word like. So, simile. Next. Bows of heaven and ocean metaphor. Bows means branches. Heaven and ocean are compared to two huge trees, and the comparison is implicit. So, metaphor. Next, line number six like the bright hair, simile, and the comparison is met explicit by like. Next, line number seven, Maynard. Here we find a Greek allusion or classical allusion. You know Minad, one of the female worshippers of Bacchus. Bacchus, the god of wine. So, classical or Greek allusion. Next, line number 9 to 10, darts of the dying year. Here we find oral effect, sound effect. Year is personified because it's dying. Next, stanza 3, summary. The wild west wind awakens or agitates the Mediterranean Sea from its peaceful sleep in summer near a Pumis Isle close to Naples. Naples, western coast of Italy. That is, here we find the activities of the west wind over the ocean. At first, west wind agitates the Mediterranean Sea. Next, the Mediterranean Sea dreamed of old palaces and towers covered with blue moss and flowers under the bottom of the sea. Next, then the wind clips the Atlantic Ocean after Mediterranean Atlantic Ocean and runs violently. 
the loud sound of the wind frightens the submarine plants that is the submarine plants are frightened and they tremble and dispel themselves so in the third stage we find the activities of the west wind over the mediterranean sea at first and then over the atlantic ocean and both mediterranean sea and atlantic ocean are agitated by the west wind next annotation of stanza 3 line number 1 waken from his summer dreams his so personification and his it refers to the mediterranean sea okay next pumis isle island formed by the deposit of lava next base bay western coast of italy near naples being a tourist place shelley might have visited this island on several occasions it may be that shelley visited the place and that's why he refers that very place next stanza for summary the poet regrets that he is not a natural object like a dead leaf or a cloud or a wave okay he speaks of himself and he regrets that he is unlike leaf cloud or wave the leaf cloud and wave share the strength of the wind and are fortified next he praises the greatest quality of the wind it is uncontrollable west wind can't be controlled the poet is nostalgic when he says that he is not what he had been in his youth here we find glorification of youth love for the past so he prays to the wind to lift him that is to invigorate him as a wave a leaf and a cloud next but now the poet falls upon the thrones of life difficulties and problems of life have chained him up and he is bleeding due to adverse circumstances the poet is bleeding he was once as timeless and proud as the wind but that's past next annotation of stanza 4 line number 5 to 6 if even i were as in my boyhood here we find love for the past nostalgia or backward looking mania and this is one of the prominent romantic traits love for the past next i fall upon the thorns of life personal despair or autobiographical elements and it reminds us the personal adversities or the difficulties shall be confronted in his personal life next line number 14 one two like the this is also love for the past okay next stanza 5 summary the poet makes an appeal to the wind to make him a liar or instrument of the wind as the forested shelly appeals the west wind to make him its instrument next he is aware of his old days and weakness but the poet is well aware that he is aged and weak still he is optimistic but he is not pessimistic that the magical power of the wind will inspire him to produce sad music that the west wind will help him to produce sad music which is the sweetest song in the world and this very sad music is the sweetest song of the world and in this context we should remember what Shelley says in To Us Kaulyak our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought next the poet says that his spirit is identical with the spirit of the west wind next as the west wind destroy all the bad elements in the world the poet is impatient enough to destroy corruption superstition laziness and oppression and create a new age a millennium where liberty equality and fraternity will blossom next he wants the help of the west wind to spread his message of regeneration this is the main idea Shelley wants to spread the message of regeneration all over the world being an optimist minded Shelley is not at all a pessimist he is an optimist Shelley hopes that if winter comes spring cannot be far behind in natural world winter comes but after winter comes spring so it is certain that a new social order will come to earth where all human beings will enjoy fraternity, peace and love. So, the poem ends with a 
with the note of a ray of hope or with an optimistic note. Next annotation line number one make me thy liar Shelley wants to be the liar of the western liar means musical instrument okay next line number five sweet though in sadness epigram contradictory how is it possible sweet or sad next be thou me Shelley wants to identify himself completely with the wind next dead thoughts here dead does not mean finished but dormant or latent in Bengali Shupto. Next line number 13, the trumpet of prophecy. Shelley considers the West Wind as an instrument by which his prophetic ideals can be broadcasted. That is, Shelley wants to spread his message through the West Wind. Next line number 14, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? The last line, most optimistic one and also one of the famous lines, interrogation. Why interrogation? This is a rhetorical device because in interrogation we know that a question is raised but the answer of that question is implied within the very question. Here we find if winter comes, can spring be far behind? So the answer is that if winter comes, spring cannot be far behind. So, rhetorically, interrogation. Thank you.